welcome to Veltalota, the officially unofficial podcast for the Expanse on AMC. No, that's not right. Amazon Prime. I, I got sci-fi. I got so many letters. I I, I almost yeah. said Expanse on GME. I really almost oh, said Expanse no. on GME. Oh uh, no! <laughs> no, it's on Bet Amazon Prime. House. Bet in the house on these diamond hands to get a season six because oh lord, that's I'm hoping to, in the future. I'm hoping to get a Winnipesaukee at home after this whole thing's <laughs> over. Here you go. So with his very own rocket. Uh, yeah, this is episode 10 of season five called Nemesis Games. It's the season finale. We've kind of all been building up to this. Uh, Nemesis Games, of course, the name of book number five, which most of the events that happen in this are based on. Uh, so, you know, they're. I think you said they're sticking with that trend. They've done this in previous seasons. Um yeah, Nothing last new. last episode of the season usually is named after the book. I think there might be an exception, um, maybe in season two and and uh, yeah, or season maybe two three. three was weird, right? Because they were like they, half season stuffed into two seasons, and yeah, it yeah, was strange. They ripple shuffled the books into two separate seasons, and and you might have had some weird stops, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, we saw Nemesis games. Also, we got uh, a, like late in the week last week, we got screeners for this, uh, as we were mm-hmm. kind of hoping. So, you're hearing this probably um, a lot sooner than we talked about in the last episode. So, because uh, we're able to get this out right in the nick of time. Uh, what'd you think of the finale episode, Jim? I like, liked it. I, th- I thought it yeah. brought it all around. You know, this, this season was, was strong. I don't think it's the best season of The Expanse, um, but I also don't think it's a bad season. Uh, Expanse doesn't really have bad seasons and yeah this was no exception it emotionally well was like super resonant at the end all, all this stuff with Naomi finally making it back to the ship um, and, and back to her crew and her people uh, and playing that message for Holden was a, a great moment I, I really liked you know Amos's goodbye with Eric, even though Eric's a bit of a scoundrel, you know, you can see there was a relationship there once that okay, that works. Um, yeah. Claire finds a new home. It's, it's all, yeah, it's all really strong stuff taking us into season six. I was surprised at how much I liked it. Like, I thought I was going to like it. Um, you know, I was I was confident that there wouldn't be a misstep, but I thought some of the things, you know, like the way they dealt with this Alex situation was such a great, such a great um, handling the reality of the situation, which is Cass Anvar has to go with the other reality of the situations uh, that we love Alex and mm-hmm. Alex didn't do anything wrong. Sure. Like Alex, the character is still great and he gets to die as a hero to save his family and buried with full military honors. Um, and the way the show handled that, like shocked me, like I wasn't expecting it. And in retrospect, Phil feels very good. And they're also doing a lot of obvious moves. I think, I think the bull bull as Alex, uh, theory is all but confirmed. He's drinking out of the man's coffee cup in this episode, sitting in the man's barca lounger. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, getting injected with the man's juice. I I think he, (laughs) he will be Alex by the time next season rolls around. The the Um, very same juice that. Killed him. No, I have bet the penis has the inferior juice. You know, the Martian oh, juice yeah. is the stuff you want. Yeah, probably. Although racing juice, racing juice, dangerous. Maybe not for the older, pot-bellied, uh, you know, Martian veterans. Maybe the, you leave yeah. that for the the young kids. Uh, that 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 the elite, that that borderline illegal racing juice. I mean, his Martian body couldn't handle the Earther juice. I get it. You know, they, they got different drugs and- for different people. And I also feel dumb because this show roped me in. Like I thought the proto molecule was dealt with. I thought yeah. the, the they were the, the ring gate was impregnable, and that fucking slippery fish, Mar- Marco, <laughs> uh, the ghost knife fish, uh, with with another goddamn micro meteor storm and uh, some some nifty torpedo decoy work is in a really strong position with these weirdo, almost religious fanatic Martian separatists. Uh, mm-hmm. That is a fascinating development. Um, and but, but uh, what I'm saying is like all of the emotional beats hit, like holding the Naomi yeah. re- reconciling and playing that message and how it, it was meant for her, but it also works beautifully as, as saying goodbye to Alex. Mm-hmm. Um, when drummer pick opens the hailing frequencies and says, Holden, it's drummer. Like, you know, and when she when she pulls the gun on Corral, 
all that stuff was so exciting and so well done. One of the best executed space battles we've had thus far too. Yeah, um, a lot of a lot of good and, tension in this episode. The the way they played with tension in the last yeah. few episodes of this season was great. Um, that that stuff where like the character's desire to get the outcome they want is the very thing that could destroy the whole situation for them. Right? It's yeah, that stuff yeah. is so good when you're pitting a character against themselves essentially. Yeah. And uh, it's yeah, it, it's it, it's fun for me too to also see like the shape of the next season to come. You know, like I've long wanted Bobby to be part of the Rasananti. It looks yeah. like there's a path open for that, uh, if nothing else, for optics. Yet, you know, like Avastral is very intent on having this like functional family that has an, at least one Earther, one Belter, and one Martian, and we're one Martian short. You know, Bulls of Terran, so we need another Martian on board the Rasananti or her little. True. Her little uh, mixed family metaphor that she's very invested in. And honestly, Marco is too. Like, Marco has got a hate boner for the Rasananti, probably a lot because of Naomi. Mm-hmm. But also, like, it is a symbol of, it, of, of unity. It is, uh, it puts to the lie everything that he says. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, I wonder if, if Earth is in, and Mars is ready to really live up to what, you know, the commitment of the Ross Nanti is because it's not like Naomi's a second class citizen on that ship. She's, no. she's second in command and everyone gets an equal share. Mm-hmm. Like, is that like, if you, if you treated the belters like that from the jump, we wouldn't be in this situation. So right. it's all really good. And the emotional stuff all worked well. Uh, there was laughs like that, you know, the Eric and Amos goodbye had one of the kind of the funniest and sneaky, funny situations. Um, in, in the series so far. And I, I really liked it. It's another strong finale. Yeah. Um, so do you want to get into the detailed conversation thing that we do? Yeah, I think we should. Um, and I'll also, before we get too far, our, what's your, what's your feelings about a, a wrap up pod? Cause I'm kind of pro wrap up pod. Uh, we could do one. Yeah. Well, I'll see why yeah. not. Yeah, I feel like because I want to do a bunch of read because like now I'm unleashed. I want to do a bunch of reading on and listen to some other podcasts because a lot of people said that some of the quibbles I've had of Naomi stuff is stuff that was addressed in various threads and podcasts. Now, I don't know how I feel about all that, but like I do mm-hmm. want to see what's out there. And I imagine people would like to talk about the season now that everything's caught up and done with. So, uh, and yeah, I still have a lot of enthusiasm for uh, the expanse. I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading Nemesis games now. But uh, let's break it down. Let's break this episode down. As the Rasananti speeds towards the chain smoker to rescue Naomi, Monica wants to review torpedo tracking logs from their fight with the Zemea, and Bull charges in to report that they've walked right into a trap. Oh, no. I don't, I don't have any notes for this scene. Because <laughs> it's, it's not like, it's just a setup scene. I don't know. Well, so they, they do a couple of things that they set up here. Number one is like, as soon as she started wanting to pull tracking logs, my heart yeah. sank. Cause I'm like, Oh fuck. It's a goddamn proto molecule. Mm-hmm. I, I, I should have known they should, they put, they, they played the old Naomi trick, put on a torpedo. And, uh, the other thing they set up is this, um, um, bulls free use of slurs. Yeah. yeah. A fictional future space slurs. He gets the Mickey's in here. He gets the skinnies in here. It's very upsetting. Like, uh, um, you know, Monica comments on it and it's going to be, uh, well, it's just something he's going to have to get over if he's going to be the Alex of the ship, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought that was, uh, pretty good. And they just established the fact that they're the Rasananti. It's a tough ship, but it's already depleted half of its defensive stores and it's going against these ships that are, you know, outgun and outnumber them heavily. This there's, there's no way they can win. That's the important thing about this. Uh, yeah. Um, the scene uh, and then drummer uh, along with her faction and two of Marco's big gun, heavy hitting Martian warships are on the hunt for the Rasananti. Um, I love this stuff. Cause like, I feel like we're getting a tail of the tape here. Like we're sizing up the ships, right? You get these big hero yeah. shots sweeping across each of them. Uh, and in this corner, <laughs> the Kyoto and the Sierra Mal with 16 guns and three yeah. rail in place. Yeah, it's like, yeah, exactly. And they look so badass. I, I really love these ships. Uh, Has a reach of 32,000 nautical miles. <laughs> right. Gross weight of 650,000 tons. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, a lot of cool character beats, too. Like, um, 
you know, Naomi's lover or not Naomi drummers lovers. It's Oksanya. Who's the guy? I don't know his name. I, have they, I, they probably mentioned it. And, and if I was, had the subtitles for these things, I would have known it by now. But uh, this guy, it's called Pete. Uh, okay. Oksana and Pete are talking about like, you know, what they're going to do with drummer. And they're trying to like, you know, you don't have to be there. We can, she, and she responds. I like this line. I don't look away from what I do. And he tries to like, Hey, come on, Kamina. And she's like, Nope, captain. Now Kamina later. Like she's all business and she's yeah. going to go through with this thing. Just keep her family safe. Um, and Oksana, like they, they discussed like that. She's burnt all of her bridges. There's no way she's like, she's pulled the gun out of her holster for the last time. It's all going to be up to this guy, mm-hmm. which sets up an interesting kind of power play later on in the episode. Um, and uh, the, you know, her inevitable, uh, betrayal of, of Marco. Uh, I looked into some of these ship names. Uh, so you've got uh, the Koto, which is a Japanese stringed instrument. It's just kind of like long, almost like harp, it's, or, or like a harp, but with a guitar body, and it like sits in a person's lap. A lot of times it's played like a big, like, like a big keyboard. Like a zither? About that size. I don't know. It's it's a uh, it's a uh, it's it's a koto. So it's a Japanese stringed instrument. And then on mm-hmm. the other hand, you got serio mall, which as well is serio is a, a Spanish word for a very serious or solemn individual or thing. And mall is bad. So I think this is like think of like John Wick. Deadly like, this serious. This is a very bad. This is a very deadly serious. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. I think is the the flavor you're supposed to get from from this ship. Mm. Um, and, uh, I like, I like the effort they put into the naming of things, even when That's I don't a understand badass name. Yeah. Admit. Yeah. Serial mall. Yeah. sounds like something from a, the good, the bad, the ugly. Yeah. <laughs> and it's probably the bad and the ugly wrapped <laughs> together. So Holden and bull, they're no dummies. They saw the tail of the tape. They realize there's no escaping this fight. So they decide to make like a Leroy Jenkins. And lead a doomed charge against the superior numbers and firepower of the Belter fleet trapping them to give Naomi a little bit more time to be rescued. Yeah, they don't. I, I, I'm not sure. They, they try and explain kind of what this gets them, you know, as a symbol um, that, that Marco wants to destroy. And I, I'm not sure I quite understand what saving Naomi and getting the Rossi destroyed accomplishes. I think it's. I think it's. I think it's that there's no way they can run. Um, and if they turn around now, is that true? These are a bunch of belters and they're outside of missile range. Are they just too much momentum? Is the orbital like mechanics not lining up for them or something? Like, (sighs) didn't didn't Holden say in the previous episode that they're burning a lot of extra fuel to get there quicker? So, like, maybe maybe they they just literally can't thrust that long. Okay, Um, that would make sense. And Bull does mention in this episode, so yeah. Yeah, so I I think that there that there's that's like they can't run, um, they can fight, and if they sprint around right now, that lengthens the apparent distance between them and Naomi and the actual rescue operation. They might be able to damage one and and take them out. Um, I, I think it's just more of like you know, hey, if we can buy them another hour or two, yeah. then because I do believe that the uh, the screaming eagle, the screaming firehawk, can outrun you know, could just burn towards the, the core worlds and, sure. and, and get to safety. Um, I do think, uh, and it, cause like bulls all like war mad, you know, he's like pissed that they're in this situation. He's pissed at Holden. I thought Holden like his like, Hey, look, I'll accept my level of responsibility, mm-hmm. but never forget that we're out here because this maniac killed our friend, fucked up the earth and declared a war. Like, we're not out here to save my girlfriend. We're out here to stop all this stuff, and we've kind of gotten embroiled in this situation. So shut, shut the fuck up and sit down. But, but Bull's more frustrated just by, like he said, it's like, you know, I hate getting killed before you even get to start fighting, you yeah. know? Yeah. Like, it's, he's, he's impotent is what he feels. Um, and I also liked Monica's, like, wait, what expression on her face when she sees these guys talking about, like, oh, we're just going to... And I also... I kind of wish we'd gotten a little bit more time with the other belters and, and the other crew of the Tycho because holy shit, just just became a suicide mission. Um, yeah, I mean, it did. It did change tone a little bit, but like, I don't know when when Monica's insistent, so insistent that she be included on this mission. I, I don't think she can, you know, really complain too much. No. She, she knew she that didn't. she was in for right and she doesn't. So credit yeah. to her. Um, yeah, 
they, they do give her a moment to go oh though so. yeah because that's the civilian it's it's all you know one thing to live through a dire situation and think you're big and bad but now to like okay well we're there's almost no way we're walking out of this and it, i think I, i'm glad that they let her be concerned without like you know tearfully going to them and be like oh guys please is there got some other way because there yeah. isn't and she knows that and she also knows she made her bed she's gonna lie in it mm-hmm. it's nice it's nice um, there's also just a brief scene of Bobby and Alex reacting to Jim's noble charge into the teeth of the, the belters. I thought that was pretty good too. Yeah. They know it's a suicide mission as well. Yeah. And you know, like, uh, yeah. like, like, uh, Alex got a little husk in his voice as he's saying, we'll get it back, Jim, go yeah. give her, go give him hell. Yeah. That's I mean, good. that's, that's his farewell message to Holden. You know, it's like pretty much. Yeah. We, I know this means everything to you. We'll, we'll get it done. And he yeah. also is trying to take advantage by like pushing the limits again. They're going to go back under full thrust to try to get a little bit, you know, because like I was even thinking this is like Jesus Christ, like the breaking and you're accelerating again. Like this has got to be pretty high risk behavior. And, and of course it is. Yeah. So yeah, we'll talk about that. So Naomi, we cut back to her and she's doing the thing she was trying to do last episode, banging on stuff, Mm -hmm. which is this. She was trying to open a nozzle that feeds one of those RCS control thrusters on the side of the ship. She successfully, after really whacking on it, bangs it open and it's able to thrust the chain smoker off course for about four seconds. But since... You know, Newton says uh, the, the, uh, once once objects in motion stays in motion, that lateral brief thrust is enough to take the chain smoker into just a spiral orbit. Now it's, right. it's essentially doing given an intergalactic yard job to the, the Milky Way. <laughs> and I was wondering what this gains her. Um, and I, I eventually realized on second watch, oh, it gives her uh, time because the thing she right. needs here is to keep the uh, screaming firehawk from getting close enough to detonate this proximity sensor on uh, this bomb. Yep. And, you know, with the trouble later that Alex has, and I think they do a really good job of, of showing here how like this screws with his straight ahead approach to docking with the ship. Yeah. It's um, now a high G turning docking scenario. It takes him who knows how long to set up this maneuver and execute it. And he's got to like get it in just the right position. It's still risky. Uh, yeah, it's it's cool. I really like what they did. And I, I for, if you're for, you'll be forgiven if you don't understand, because in the first watch, I'm like, well, I don't stand. So it, it deviates like it just like it, it'd be like on the highway if a car just like kind of veered left for a second and then came back. But the crucial thing you have to realize is this is actually like you take the steering wheel and you just turn it a little bit and it just stays there. Yeah, because unless there's a thruster to, to knock it back the other way, it's always going to have this yawing attitude that's going to turn it into the spiral so now it's just sitting there and doing circles in space which is dangerous to dock and you know just it just slows things down a little bit it mm-hmm. it, it, it 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 doesn't necessarily work in the end but you know there's some risk uh, there too if she were to you know if, the, if this gas were to spin her a little too fast you know she could black out from the g's oh like, yeah it's a pretty risky thing but at this point she's out of options yeah, and I thought they did a good job of showing selling the high G because, like, when the helmet starts to roll vertically, you know, I horizontally on the deck, and she looks at it and she smiles because she knows that she's accomplished it. Yeah, it's really nice, really nice moment. And again, they don't they don't really take the time to explain. You they fully expect you to like keep up, man. Like you know, she banged on the thruster. Yeah. There's a one sign, there's a thing where they, uh, I think it's either Alex or. Bobby say that she's in a she's in a spiral now and that's it like you know you have to kind of understand space mechanics so um and there's even like you know all this stuff that like it's so clever how they use this to to say goodbye to Alex but they're already setting up like how dangerous this is and they, they did this before this isn't something they wrote you know, just in case, you know, Cass Anvar goes rogue. They talked about this with Avastral and Bobby using a screaming Firehawk, how like, you know, especially older people and Alex isn't as old yeah. as Avastral, right. but he's at least a decade older than everyone else on the Rocinante. That sounds right. Yeah. I think you're supposed to understand he's in his late forties and everybody else is in their, you know, early thirties. So, you know, he's that maybe has a, a weakened sidewall and his vessels or something. So, mm-hmm. but they talk about that and all the dangers. Um, and I thought that's uh, pretty cool. 
uh, our next scene, and this is a big one. This is good. This is a lot of a lot of uh, episode. Uh, after preparing for battle, the Rasananti engages the combined Belter hunting party. Drummer takes advantage of the fog of war to turn the tide of the battle. Uh, let's just talk about the whole fucking thing. Um, okay, and this is like also intercut a little bit with the Alex and Bobby stuff. Is that right? Um, no, no, it's that, it, it, okay. This that is happens all right a, before can, this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Gotcha. Um, th- th- well, it starts with uh, Holden shutting down the skinnies shit, right? Um, the the bulls pulling, yeah. Like he he tells him, you know, not to say that again. Uh, which I, I like. Bull- the ships. Oh, They're bull. like fanning out, and you know, what is this guy doing? Does he not realize that he's talking about Naomi every time he says skinnies? Holden is hearing, "I hate your girlfriend." Like <laughs> the hell. I'll say this. Um, I have some sympathy to veterans that fight wars against people where it's like the dirtiest fighting. Like if you go, sure. if you go to, if you fought like in Iwo Jima and you came away from that hating Japanese people, or you had a buddy's head blown in half in, in Iraq and you feel a certain way about Muslims. Mm-hmm. Like I understand that, but part of returning to society is learned like letting that go to what extent right. possible and and holding is like you know it's like i get it like these people are just your fucking enemy that you yeah. have bled in the mud and if you swap blood and mud or whatever the shit they, they talked about with fred but like you gotta stop it because yeah that is my girlfriend mm-hmm. that is my best friend pilot who's about to heroically sacrifice himself to save said girlfriend yep. and you, you, you gotta so I, I i thought it was really good it wasn't you know, Holden's like, I'm not passing judgment. I'm not doing this. And he even says, yeah. like, I understand mm-hmm. you, you had a lot of history of these people and you're trying to work yourself up into a battle frenzy. And everybody's pissed, a- right? Holden's pissed. Sure. Like uh, the entirety of, of the, the well wallers are pissed. Like, yeah. Yeah. You can't be saying that also. Like, I'm just thinking like most of his crew are pelters. I know. Too. That's a thing. Like, 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 she's- open, it's like, what the fuck? Bull- what shut- yeah. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Well, Walla. for the good of the crew, he's got to shut his mouth. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is awesome. You know, a uh, drummer, you know, claims a misfire after firing the first, uh, round of torpedoes and crawl like hits her head. Um, when she's bashed with a fire extinguisher or whatever. Why does why does drummer do this? Was she always planning to do this? Because I almost seemed like there was like these wheels spinning in her head and she kind of like. I don't think is well thought out. It's just that she saw the opportunity. Carl was distracted by the imminent battle and she saw uh, an opportunity to to change things. Um, And I think like that idea of. You know, she's she's headed out. She's on a mission and it's coming down to it where she's going to have to push the button to kill Naomi's boyfriend. It, can she do that? Can she make that call? And it's one thing to say, okay, I'm going to do that. But when you actually get down to it and you have to do it and the moment is here, she was unable to do that. It, that's that's kind of how I feel. Like Naomi has been yeah. circulating in the back of her head. And they do, they have these really great ways to build tension in the space battles because like, you know, you have to like, this is like the old timey ships. You have to rig it for battle. Like you have, everyone has to get in a spacesuit because you take a PDC round or a rail cannon round, suddenly the whole ship's vented. So everyone's got to get in their suits. Everyone's got to get like all their, the, the weapons go, uh, uh, all sorted. And there's all this last minute activity and allows everyone to go from ship to ship and see everyone looking serious in their helmets. And um, the music, like a lot of people talk shit about the expanse music or say it's like, oh, you know, man. not, it's not super distinctive. I won't say that like I ever hum a lot of the expanse theme except for maybe the credits but like it's really good in like that battlestar galactica way of yeah. like getting you amped and jacked mm-hmm. and letting building those moments of tension and that moment where you've got this music you've got the countdown on the scanners the the five belter ships getting closer to rossi in the middle and panning from drummer to corral and then she pulls it's it's really exciting um and so what it i is. think happens is drummer shoots and disables uh uh, uh um uh ashford's Dakota? old ship oh okay gotcha. i think so she disables that ship it's tough to tell and these space battles i want to say are a little bit jumbled like even though they show those tail of the tape pans across the their bows 
uh, early yeah. on. I still can't really tell them apart in frenzied firefights. I, I just think that like the the Martian ships are very distinctive, and it looked like that the the, the, the the three Erector set ships are drummers, and it looked like one of the Erector sets filed uh, uh, on the other Erector set and uh, well, disabled were, it. They're definitely trying to disable like the bigger gunships here. Um, that's like one yeah. of her first targets. Uh, I know the Kodo is targeted second, I think, with with that other mm. volley. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I think her uh, boyfriend on yeah. the Pete, he fires the last for, uh, at the biggest Martian sh- warship. Yeah. So I think it like they take out whatever Ashford ship is. And then because that's the other thing is like when the impact hits, like the belters like slam forward. And that was one of drummer ships. So I, I think she took out one of her own just to disable it, to get out of the fight, mm-hmm. took out one of the other. And, and then the Rasinanti gets into it. Um and it's it's fucking exciting. Like Carol, Carol gets the upper hand. Like like dr- one of drummers dudes mutinies and bear hugs her. Carol gets her at gunpoint, and then one of the, the the little baby belters that was like one of the most outspoken against joining uh, the Marco's cause. Like mm-hmm. just way laser with a fire extinguisher kills, kills her. her. One yeah. shot. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, it's a uh, fucking fucking. Uh, that's that's a lot of mass swinging out of someone's head. Um, mm-hmm. She's doing the Han Solo thing where like obviously the Kyoto is or Koto is like furious. Like, what the fuck are you doing? And she's like, ah, I've got a out of weapons malfunction over here. Large leak, very dangerous. Um, <laughs> right. And then then it's uh then it's just a belter heavy frigate versus the Rasinante. And you're like, I was thinking, damn, maybe it can win. Mm-hmm. Maybe it can win because the, the like they're just gonna do this. Full high speed guns blazing past anything that can happen, but then Pete launches every fucking missile on the Defotang. I think that's the name of that ship. Uh, uh, at, at the the last Martian frigate, and something happens. I don't quite understand it. Um, I'm not sure if time is slowing down for us to see, but there's like this little purple satellite glowing thing. Yeah, which I'm like, is that because, you know, I played this game FTL where you've got like defense drones that kind of circle the ship and not like, mm-hmm. is this like a next level PDC that kind of orbits the ship? Or is this a weapon that they fired that shoots like some purple shit at the Martian thing that makes it explode? I don't know. But the frigate goes boom at the end of the day. <laughs> right. That's all you really need to know. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely couldn't tell what that was, but it was interesting. I thought maybe reading the book, you would like, oh, well, here's the thing. They have this experimental Martian weapon system and blah, blah, blah. Or uh-huh. this is the ghost knife that Ashford, uh, 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 you know, pioneered back in the Belter War of 23 19 or something i oh yeah no, i think it, it, like marco's ghost knife shows up later in the form of uh micro asteroids uh yeah which is sure. pretty amazing but we'll get there for sure uh i, I but it all looks very cool it's exciting oh yeah it, it's amazing like i really like this flavor of space battle um you know it's not star wars right it's a little more grounded in reality yeah. uh a, a little more uh, it's it's not even Star Trek because Star Trek tends to be like slower, um, at least in the way it's shot. Like like these are big hulking ships, sort of like you know just hanging out there. Whereas these seem a little more nimble, but also once you get on a trajectory, that's kind of just the way you're going. And, and it's so fast, and the distances like right in Star Trek, it's it's filmed like Napoleonic era, 18th century age of sail. Like yes. these ships ponderously move. I mean, they're supposed to be going to fractional speeds of light, and they're just like ponderously passing each other and yeah. and doing these low bank turns. But in the Expanse, like one of the reasons it's so hard to follow is once a torpedo hits and shoots it, the camera just jumps. Yeah, was probably thousands of kilometers through space to to like show you some other action of the battle because they're not. Not like it's it's always ridiculous in space battles when you have like 10 Romulan cruisers against I don't know 70 like these ships in, in reality would be firing from like outside visual range and the expanse yeah. does that the mm-hmm. expanse feels like real space combat and even if it's hard to follow sometimes it's super cool to watch yeah uh chaotic I I was surprised the drummer had to fight this hard against her own ships um I kind of assumed that with if drummer gave the word, all of her crew or most like ninety nine percent of her crew would rebel with her. But it's not it the case. Yeah, it doesn't appear to be. And I, I felt like 
I kind of thought so too, but also they've done a really good job of showing how the rest of her crew might have gotten skeptical about like, hey, do you put us like, are we a f- what's first, the safety of the family or some other cause or some other entanglement? This you know, bitch, we don't even know Naomi, for example. Yeah, um, I thought they'd done a really good job of kind of like laying those personal politics. So. You know, the majority of the crew went along, but you needed a couple of lucky breaks here and there. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, like it's such a moment, even though this is like the battle's over, it was such a moment when drummer finally gets a hold of, of Holden and, you know, says it's it's me. It's yeah. it's a real moment. I'm just like, yeah, like, fuck yeah. Because that's what I was, you know, we I, I've been saying this since episode five. I was like, I don't know how, I don't know. But at some point, drummer and Holden will be on the same side in this battle. It's going to be fucking cool. And yeah, paid off. Yep. Meanwhile, on board the chain smoker, Namely realizes that nothing that she's done so far is going to deter Alex from docking with this damn thing to rescue her. So she prepares to make one final spacewalk. But to our surprise, Naomi is recovered successfully and we're forced to say goodbye to a great pilot and a good compadre, one Alex Kamal. Yeah, man. I love these scenes. So we've talked about some of the action scenes in this show, um, especially this season, not being shot from particularly exciting angles. And this is one that's also very close up. Um, but this one, the, the, the close up felt right because of the emotion of the scene, um, the, the desperation that you get to see on Naomi's face and the fear. And oh, I loved it, man. I can't even imagine just throwing yourself out of a ship into nothing, knowing that's it. With no air. No air. Yeah, you're you're dead in, you know, five minutes. Um, yeah, it's it's really, really cool. I love how they stick with Naomi's face through 99 percent of this scene. Such, Even such a great artistic decision when Bobby shows up. Right. And, and you can sort of like the way they play the sound, the sound design in the show is so good because you're kind oh, yeah. of on the edge of consciousness with Naomi. Right. And and being out in space, you're not hearing a lot of things except through suit contact and it's helmet really contact. Yeah, conductive, like you know, the vibrations of their of their voice, and that's how Belters communicate. You know, and and so, like, you've got Bobby showing up, and you got you get the impression that like she's got one hand on her, right? And she's mm-hmm. fiddling with a hose to try and hook it up to her her air supply. It's the medical system, yeah. And you can kind of hear what she's saying a little bit because yeah. it's coming through like the glove, maybe on her shoulder or something. Right, right, right. And then when she actually gets a hold of her and gets like her arms around her and her helmet up against her other her helmet, yeah. which we've seen before, we've seen clear. people talk helmet to helmet without any cons before in the show. Yeah. So I loved it, man. I thought this thing was just brilliantly shot. It was. Uh, I want to talk about some problems with it later, but uh, yeah, I just want to echo all those decisions. Like we hang like inside Naomi's helmet for like almost the entirety of this thing. And, you know, I was thinking like, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe Naomi does die or she doesn't get to her. Cause like someone, someone sent in an email or maybe tweeted at me. Like what if, wh- why would Naomi just blow herself up? Mm-hmm. because we we got all these tamper and actually I found myself that's one of I guess a problem is that her jumping out and trying to do these belter hand signals seems like a hail mary it is whereas yeah. if what if she just taken like her little spanner and pried off one of those tamper things and bl- and and blown the ship up that would have absolutely saved Alex and Bobby it almost is like yeah like I I feel like again this show got a little too clever for itself um, overall, I really like the Naomi chain smoker plot, but mm-hmm. I think they cut a few corners and maybe should have spent some more time in the writer's room asking questions about this stuff. If they're going to blow, you know, turn this into a, cause it doesn't seem like this is as much of a meal in the books. No, um, it, it's a big meal. Um, really? a, a lot of this is a meal. It's just different because Naomi, her whole approach to this is very much from the, like, it's uh, her potentially committing suicide angle. And it's, it's really mm. like, it kind of portrays her as, as you know, it, typically how women are portrayed in media where like, Oh, you know, they're the only thing that matters is their, their kid. And like, if they mm. can't have that, they're going to kill themselves. And it's just like, 
it's it's so much mm. better in the show and i feel like maybe part of the reason she doesn't just blow up the ship and killing herself and saving her friends is because they didn't want that to play into it at all like that that thought okay. was never in her head i'm not going to kill myself because if i kill myself marco wins you know it's it's i don't know Th- then i leave philip for good right um mm. i think there's a lot of like she doesn't want Marco to win this in any way. And if whether mm. she dies or the Rossi dies, that's a victory for Marco. Mm. Yeah, I just felt and then look, it's tough because um, when you got a person alone in a survival situation, like we saw this with Tom Hanks and Castaway, like there's only so many ways you can get these people talking to themselves and explaining right. what the hell they're doing. And short of like getting the bloody volleyball in there, you know, you've got just, you know, like I, I thought it was all very natural. The remarks that she, you know, when she calls like uh, Alex a brave idiot and when she's, you know, whimpering about this or that, I thought that was all natural. But like, I did wonder, it's like, well, like if you if this doesn't work, then you're dead. And so is Alex and Bobby. But if you just blew the ship up, I, I wish there was a technical reason why she couldn't have. And I just felt like, again, this this just lowers the this is the first time I've ever seen the expanse kind of take these kind of shortcuts and maybe they're not even shortcuts, but yeah, she jumps out there. She does the belter emergency hand oh, signal. I, I fucking love the, the signal for kaboom. It's just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? it, it felt like she's because like first it felt like she's doing this weird like uh, Haka kind of like war dance uh-huh. thing because, you know, uh, but yeah, it's like, and, and Alex, of course, I guess, knows the Belter sign. Um, I, I wonder where he picked that up and the ice hauling stuff, probably. Yeah, could be. Uh huh. They, they would have a lot of yeah. use for those hand signals, for sure. Right, 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 right. Um, and it's, it's weird because, like, I thought that it'd be a standardized thing. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, because, um, like, in, if you go through diving school, there's all kinds of, like, universal sign language for divers, you know, like, I haven't done my air supplies gone, like, all kinds of stuff. Um, and, so and you I think bet it would be as as marine you probably also learn that shit right like there's a lot yeah. of anybody who's going into space probably needs to learn that stuff but they shouldn't call it belter sign language then it should just be like yeah. hey you know this is like, like the nato alphabet if they called that like i don't know the american sign the american phonetic alphabet well everyone uses it so what the fuck but i don't know Eh, anyway, Cyrillic. There are other alphabets, but yeah, I get you. Yeah, I also think it's like it's, it's some. So Alex, talk about Alex dying. Mm-hmm. This is clearly they did not bring uh, Cass Anvar back to be like, hey, look, fucker, you you did some you did some dirty shit, and you're going to give your character a graceful end note, or we're going to you know what d- double double fire you, right? They clearly put this together from a, a few spare frames that they slowed down to, to 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 suggest that he's just there. And it's, you know, that's what you'd look like if you're dead floating from a massive stroke uh, hemorrhaging out in your brain. Right. For sure. Um, and they had I think they, they took a couple of his lines where he's because they, they had this thing where he was like shaking his head because he's woozy from the massive breaking run. I think they're going to set all that stuff up anyway. Mm-hmm. But like. Yeah, they scrapped together a few like kind of out of context voice clips about him saying that was a hell of a ride and he kind of felt felt like he was getting loopy and then they smash cut to him with some CGI blood and that's it. Like it's matter of fact, it reminded me honestly of the medic that got killed. I can't even remember the dude's name in uh, episode four where it's like, yes, yeah, he's a main off. character and then his head's gone and that's it. Like, yeah, this life was goes on. This is as unceremonious as it as it comes. Uh, I I both I, I dislike how sort of out of the blue it is. Although it does make sense, like if this thing were to happen and it just so happened that it took place off camera, that's gonna that's what you're gonna see if you come back to it. Um, maybe yeah. I, I don't know about blood and zero G and could it actually drip down? As, I I don't know. Um, but I'm not yeah. going to nitpick. What I do like about this um, is the, the, the consequences of like using the juice and going into high G burns have never actually been realized in this show. They're always talked about. Right. They're always talked about. Yep. And, and we've never seen it really affect anybody um, other than just like, you know, people 
grunting because it's stressful. Yeah, or Avastral starts to pass out, but you know, her, sure. Yeah. But, but we've never seen, or I think maybe uh, she was bleeding at one point or something, but yeah, we haven't yeah, seen it so. kill anybody. It hasn't been detrimental to that degree. And this felt like, okay, now I get what high G burns can do to you on, on the juice. Yeah. And uh, I thought, like, again, it's effective because it's a great way of it's, it's a dangers it's danger in space. Um, you know, I'm sure if this was all intended in the plot, there would be a bigger moment. But honestly, yeah. the crew just privately celebrate, you know, privately recognizing his death and come to grips with it. And you're hearing he's going to be buried with full Martian military honors like I. It's about the best way you can send off Alex in these circumstances. And right. again, like I really liked the way that they found a way to give Alex a nice heroic send off because again, Alex didn't do a damn thing wrong. <laughs> um, so, uh, and it's just, yeah, all the, I just want to like, continue to echo the, the decision to have Naomi and like, you just see the stars spinning. And then you, just as you think it's getting to be too late, uh, you know, Bobby smashes into her and you don't even know what's going on at first, but then yeah. you do. And then the stars start to slow down and then move in one direction. So it's like, they don't even have to explain this. It's just so elegantly done. And, you know, like Bobby's leaning in and saying, you know, you can hear Alex say, is she okay? She's like, I'm not sure. Cause his name is in her blowing snot bubbles. She's like <laughs> losing her shit. Yeah. Uh, so much pain and relief. Um, it's great. It's great. Uh, who's not having a good time about this is one Marco who aboard the Pella is just losing his shit over the Rocinante once again, foiling his evil plans. Yeah. But he finds himself impressed with the son's newfound sense of purpose and maturity. Does he? God, I can't tell I don't this know, fucking man. guy. I don't fucking know. He's either gaslighting his son again, or he's actually genuinely impressed with something that to me is obvious that Philip is torn up about like Philip is not in a good mental state. You can see it all over his face. You can hear it in his tone. I don't know why Marco thinks he's got any kind of victory here with his son. I think sometimes narcissists are oblivious to things. And also the fact that like Philip is doing the thing that his father's been like, you know, the, the fact that he's apparently making this like, Hey, you know what, dad, here's why I'm not upset. You know, your long term plan is still in effect and we're still going to win. So fuck the haters, kind of like that's kind of been him saying, like, you can't be emotional. You got to use the thing. You got to use your anger and your pain to like he's ostensibly following all those. So, like, it flatters Marco to think that his son is doing so well because of his tutelage and training. Yeah. It has to be his narcissism getting in the way because his words are saying that, but his demeanor is saying face to the body language is I, but what, okay. What do you think Philip is thinking here? Because I don't think he's thinking my mom is great and my dad's a bastard. It's just, Oh, there's confusion for sure. Ling doubts lingering. Yeah. Um, you know, Avenues, the roads not taken, um, decisions being questioned. Um, and he's not, he knows he's not in a safe environment to express any of that stuff. So he just keeps it all, you know. A lot of times that's the thing of like the, these really controlling narcissistic parents has turned their, to turn their children into lying machines, you know, bury everything down, don't give them anything to work with, like yeah. the survival. And, and they preface. Uh, they preface this scene with Philip sitting on his bed, uh, you know, fingering his gun and like, you know, sitting yeah. up in that like militaristic, like hardened posture as if we're supposed to buy that he has actually turned a corner and he's all in on his dad's mission. I don't I buy it. Well, see, I actually was the opposite. I thought, holy shit. Philip's going to go in there and blow Marco's brains out. Right. Cause yeah, yeah. I, I was confused when nothing happened. Nothing came of that. Right. What is, what is that but moment? I think, you're, showing I think you're right. You're supposed to show that this guy, like, I, look, I don't think that Philip knows himself what the hell is going on between his ears, but he is yeah. trying to be the brave soldier and, you yeah. know, stealing himself for yet another, like this thing they're doing at the ring gate, which I don't quite fully understand myself, um, is a big deal. Mm hmm. Like, I mean, it's like a bigger deal than you can conceive of. Like, imagine if humanity is about to make first contact 
with an alien species or something, and some person just comes in there and YOLOs the ceremony and blows it up. Yeah. You know, like you fundamentally change the course of human evolution. You, your 10 fingers and 10 toes did it. Mm. Like that's kind of crazy. And I think he's stealing himself for that kind of, you know, the stuff his mom's saying about like, you know, being the death, the death of millions. Like now you're con- like, if you're shutting down the gate to immigration, you're dooming billions of people to, to poverty and deprivation. And that was before the earth got fucked up. So yeah, one of the big kind of, if we, we, when we do our after uh, our, our wrap up podcast, like that's one of the big kind of like questions. My mind disappointments is we don't really know the state of the earth um, going into season six. Um, in a series of brief scenes, cause this episode gets a little return of the Kingy uh, with the multiple endings. Um, oh yeah. And ser- but in a series of brief scenes, Naomi comes to grips with the loss of Alex. Uh, the chain smoker is destroyed and Naomi plays her in case something goes wrong message for Holden, who didn't have the, the, the strength to do it before as they are burning their way towards Luna. Yeah. I mean, the real standout scene here to me is Naomi and Holden. Um, yeah. Listening to this message together and, you know, knowing that what it meant for them, but also what it means to Alex. Um, yeah, it's a good moment. I, I couldn't help but notice, at least in the copy that I have, uh, the screener copy, which is not a great resolution. I don't think Holden shed a single tear, like actually shed a tear. His eyes got watery. I'll give him that. Naomi shedding tears. I don't know about Holden. He's have holding we it seen together. Steven Strait shed a tear. Probably. Maybe. Mm, why would he? I'm trying at to this think. Point? <laughs> if this yeah, one, I'm trying him, to we'll think. Will. If we've ever seen like Wes Chatham or Stephen Strait shed a tear, uh, not not Amos. Um, he might have. He might have. But uh, yeah, I don't know. That might be that might be a holding limitation. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But regardless, it's a, a highly emotional scene, and it's very good. And it's so great because it works so good to, as a way to say goodbye to to Alex. Um, the you know like don't waste this love that we've built up between ourselves and grow it. Um, mm-hmm. uh, take what we've got and build on it because that's how we'll always keep these people alive, and that's how they're going to keep uh, Alex alive. I do wonder going forward if Alex becomes just like a person, you know, persona non grata on the show, or like they do have like tributes to him. Cause I think I honestly, I'm completely cool with all like tributes. Like if there's a plaque mm-hmm. in his honor on the Rastadanti, like a little shrine, like I think that would be cool because again, mm-hmm. Alex is not, you know, Cass. No, uh, they're no. not. They're not the same people. They so. do have a literal plaque in this episode with the, the names they of do. the crew of the Rossi on it. So he's on there. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like I wonder if Amos will like chisel it off. You know, like he, <laughs> like he did the Martian, the Martian flag. flag. <laughs> oh no! Oh yeah. god! He says, hey, he's hey, he's not a crewman anymore, right? You know, uh, you're not uh, wrong, Amos. You're just an asshole. <laughs> yeah, read the fucking room. Read the fucking room, you meathead. Uh, but I, I, I it's, it's not a lot of time to breathe because again, they didn't intend to have to do any of this stuff, but like, you know, Naomi and the, these are all had to be reshoots, right. Um, where they're talking about, uh, you know, him dying of a stroke. It's, it, it could happen to any of us versus, yeah, but he did it saving me from my own mistakes. I thought that was pretty poignant. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also like Bobby's helping Monica un- unravel the the torpedo situation, and Bo- Bobby makes a little reference about the Rossinanti being an especially tough ship, which that's always nice. Uh, they do destroy the chain smoker because it's, it's essentially a, a a continuing hazard to people. Um, and she also worries about being a criminal, and Holden's like, ah, now nah, you got valuable intelligence about Marco and all this stuff, and you were a prisoner versus you know. If you if essentially if you weren't a criminal before, you're not going to be a criminal now. Is this because uh, of the code that she wrote that was being used in? I think she's talking about just like being with like, cause it. Oh. If you want to be a bloody minded idiot, you could be like, oh well, she left the Rasinanti and joined up with Marco during the asteroid attack during this. Like you know, he's killed a bunch of Martian ships at this point. Like there's a lot of blood on her hand. If you want to say that she wanted to rejoin her 
terrorist old mates, then you could probably make that case. Yeah, that's a that's a pastor move right there. That's not an Avatarla <laughs> move. Yeah, that's not a, that's a that's some pastor bullshit. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I also I thought it was funny, especially on the second watch when she's playing these words. It it kind of seems like she's got telepathy, right? This is like one of those scenes in Star Trek where Troy and Riker are talking to each other in their heads because she's just like looking at him lovingly and she's saying, <laughs> and all these words are playing and it's just like, yeah, she's like just beaming it into a skull is what it looks like. If you walked in yeah. on this scene, you didn't know better. You'd be like, oh, fuck, Naomi just got Jean Grey powers. Sure. True. She got possessed by those fire demons and now she can speak with her mind. Um, then... In a completely different emotional uh, turn, uh, Marco sends a message to Drummer. Yeah, uh, this message. fucking guy. Uh, he's killed Serge, uh, and she's next. Apparently, by the look into the camera that he gives, his his fucking blue steel turn to the camera. I, this guy, I mean, he's meant, he's look. I have to take him serious because he's like a murder. He's a he's a killer. Oh yeah, a mass but murder. A, a, the looks on his face sometimes are just so like. Uh, he, it, it's actually less chilling that you turned to the camera and looked right into it. Like it was pretty fucking gangster. You spacing this guy and kicking him out the door just to make the point. Like it'd been, I think, even more badass if he just walks off. But he has to like dramatically turn and stare down the camera. And I'm like, man, I can't wait till you're dead. I, I think you look at the camera before you kick the guy out the airlock and then just mm. walk away. Yeah. You know, you're not looking at your own explosion, but. Um, but this sets off a chain reaction in, on, in Drummer's family uh, because Oxania rightfully accuses Drummer of lying. You know, you said you wouldn't put our family at danger over this, and you did, and one of us is dead. Naomi's alive, but one of our family is dead mm-hmm. uh, because of you and your lies. And the drummer says, well, you know, the thing is, is there's no place for any of us to go. There's only one side for us to, to do now. Uh, we can still be there and Oksanya stone cold. We got nothing to stay together for and her and vanilla ice are going to take off on the Defotang and <laughs> be gone. Yeah. Uh, but I think her, like her other, like main squeeze in this family turns mm-hmm. his back on her at this point. Yeah. Uh, Oksana yeah. I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Pete, Pete stays with drummer. Sure. Pete's, uh, sticking behind. So yeah, I mean, I assume, you know, she's just going to take her ship and go, right? I don't think there's going to be any further conflict here. Um, But I do wonder what the fuck she does, because she is... I mean, I guess she could join up with the combined Earther, Good Belter fleet, um, and but but it seems like she's going to... Like, I don't know what what life you can make for yourself out here in between these big war factions. Yeah. Um, And I I don't know, like, I, I guess I shouldn't expect to see her ever again. But um, yeah, it was sad and it was a long time coming. Mm. Um, but I am excited to see drummer fighting for the, the, the good side. And I also also wonder how that looks because Avasarala in this next scene, you know, she th- there's a, something else that um, in like a throwaway scene, we see Avasarala doing this press conference where she's like, hey, people, the belt, let me reassure you that we do not see you all as enemies. And even though we've taken a real s- strong punch in the nuts, we're not going to go crazy and kill all you people. I wonder how, like, because you've got parts of the belt, parts of Mars that have lost their fucking mind and, and want blood and vengeance. So you've got maybe the remaining faction of Martians and some factions of Belters and, um, and Earth, I guess all of Earth is still in the house not divided. They're going to all, I, I just think I just going to be, it's going to be interesting to see how all these people, like, this coalition of the willing fights, you know, especially since the Martian yeah. separatists seem like all they want to do is go through the gate and, and fuck off and be left alone. Yeah. Did they, uh, did they say in previous episodes, whether they actually hit palace and destroyed it? They did hit palace. Yes. Okay. And they were considering so we hitting series, right? But they, they, but they did not shut that yeah, down. They, of, they did uh, the, the soft coup. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you're going to have a lot of Belters who are really pissed off at them for hitting Palace. Um, it's true. Who knows how many it's of true. them they'll get on their side. Yeah, but I don't know. Like, I'm seeing, like, in a newspaper what I'd think about as a Belter, and I'd see that, like, oh, God, Marco, like, destroyed a good portion of Earth. Oh, God, that's bad. 
then Earth destroys Palace Station. Fuck those guys. They're assholes. But then there's a soft coup on Earth, new management, and they're coming out and be like, hey, hey, sorry about that. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I guess it depends on the belter, doesn't it? It's going to be really For interesting sure. to see what, what it looks like, like how much time elapses. Like, I imagine that you're going to flash forward to like the end of this war because, you know, <laughs> there's not enough seasons left to tell like a whole big solar system war. You're going to have to like, you know, hey, there'll be some losses. There'll be, some, there's an, there'll be a desperate situation, but there's one last thing that's got has to happen and that'll be next season. Um, that's my that's my bet anyway. Yeah, we'll see. Um, on Luna, Amos parts with his Baltimore brother before being reunited with his real family. Which Holden finds to his dismay has just gained a new member. How about that, Holden? How about that? So the true villains of this season are not the Marcos, but they're the Moon People. You look up, you see a bottle of tequila coming. It's Moon Gravity. It's falling at like a mile per hour. You catch that bottle. You catch the but bottle. What if, you, what if you're an Earth or refugee? You've never been to the Moon, and all you see is you look up and you see this bottle spinning towards you. Like your reflexes will probably have you just like dodge it, right? I. <sighs> Maybe. I don't know. Have these people ever played baseball? Like, is baseball still a thing? Because, like, you could tell the difference between a 70 mile an hour fastball and a 30 mile an hour peewee softball pitch. Like, I'm just saying something heavy <laughs> over your head in Earth gravity. We've been taught that's a that's a hazard. And, you know, but yeah, you got like three seconds to catch it and figure that shit out. Do it, man. That's valuable. You know how valuable tequila is going to be? Like, mm. That, that bottle is probably enough to get you a year's worth of rations on the moon could be good good earth tequila sure yeah sure. but to the, i, I to did the right I, underworld uh kingpin yeah for sure yeah and we've had checkoffs uh low g scott or low g hooch all this season <laughs> all building up to we have the tragedy of amos's lost tequila uh i thought it's good you know the fact that like you know eric and him are on good terms again Hey, you know, like uh, Eric's going to go out to the frontier and, you know, just like Murtry said, hey, there's no post offices and no cops out here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we are kings. And Amos would probably do really well in that environment. But you know what? He's got his own thing going. Oh, yeah. And uh, the introduction I that was great. of Clarissa to the, the Rossi crew is interesting. It's done. Uh, the same thing happens in the book, but it's done a little differently where Holden is given a lot more time to be way more resistant to this idea in the show. Like I, I love how Amos distracts him. I do long too. enough for Clarissa to like get right up on them almost as she's walking by to where he's not even going to see her. Um, mm-hmm. But he has almost no reaction to it, which is surprising considering his reaction in the book, which is one of, I thought, hell no, this is not happening. Oh, of course, of course. But you know it's going to happen anyway. So I kind of like the Amos is just like, hey, you remember that time you're going to kill me? Yeah. And it wasn't that, it wasn't and now. That seems crazy. Like, we're like brothers now, right? This is it's like, and there's no hard feelings. You know, like people can change. You know, I got your back. And, and Holden's like, yes, of course, we're family now. Cool. Yeah. I knew you'd see it that way. Come on board, Claire. And the look on it's like I, I think it's funnier playing it as fun as as comedy that like Holden obviously has a lot of misgivings about this, but like mm-hmm. Amos has got him airtight and all he can do is, you know, like sit there at the shocked look on his face. And Clarissa lit this sheepish high and then just as like Holden's trying to figure out what to do, like Amos says, Come on, Peaches, come on up, and just like dra- drags her right past. Yep. It's good. It's good. It I thought that it's was very a good. very and then, like, you know, again, I, if I had my druthers, you'd, you'd have, um, like, a dedicated saying goodbye to Alex kind of thing. Kind of like, you know, where all, you know, you, you give 10, 15 minutes for us to breathe. But we're not going to get that because it was all emergency jettison of Cass Anvar. Yeah, you but want like, your, your shooting Spock into space scene, right? That's what you want. You do. You want Ta- Tasha Yar in the holodeck, everyone saying goodbye and getting a speech and all that. But you're not... But like this, where like everyone kind of talks about, you know, like, oh, you were close. Oh, you're this. And oh, well, you know, brave idiots are worse than being had. And, you know, going down, standing your ground, protecting your family. All that stuff is great. And then the painting over to the, the dedication plaque, mm-hmm. the Rasananti legitimate salvage. I, it's pretty good. Pretty good way to cobble an ending from almost nothing. Uh, we got a couple more endings to go at McAuliffe Lounge on Luna. Uh, Av- uh, Avastrala hosts a welcome back party for the Rasinante and holds them up as examples of Belter, Martian, and Earther cooperation. Yeah, um, unity is how we this, win. I mean, the Claire, this, this right up Claire's alley, right? Right. 
uh, this bar, uh, McAuliffe, um, is named, I think, after Krista McAuliffe, who is the teacher who lost her life in the first space shuttle explosion. Huh. Um, okay. So I thought that I, I love how they they weave real parts of Terran's uh, history into the show. Um, but yeah, it's um, my my big question coming out of this um, is number one: Why are they put Bobby in this terrible, terrible? jetsons retro outfit holy shit this is bad this is like something out of space force the the tv show right yeah it's not it's yeah it's it's not good it's not good i hope she has a better uniform going forward um second it sounds like the rossinantes signed up for the war as a privateer of some sort which is cool very cool what you hope for um second of all is Avasarala willing to do the things that she's saying she's because like we pointed out this in the introduction, like the reason Rasanante works is because everyone is equal and everyone's respected. Like, are you willing mm-hmm. to commit to that for the belt? Because if not, this yeah. is just a bunch of meaningless PR bullshit, which I'm sure the belters have gotten at least a hundred plus years of meaningless PR bullshit. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah. And what does that even look like? You know, I don't know. I mean, she's the, the, she's been the only advocate uh, at the higher levels of government for them uh, during this whole thing. So, yeah, yeah, I, I'm hoping so. Um, you know, it's it's also probably how Holden and the crew of the Rasinante feel. It's how uh, Claire feels, obviously, like so, so many of the, the forces around here are unifying and I hope it stays that way. Yeah. Uh, and then we have another ending where Marco and Philip are making a big move at the ring ring gate. Just as Monica realizes that what we feared for most a half a season is coming true. The proton molecule is viable and intact and in the hands of bad people. Uh, yeah, this was wild because again, I thought the show was telling me I don't have to worry about the ring gate. Mm-hmm. And Mark, that was Marco's whole plan. Like, I don't know how he's got this this wizardry of micrometeors and stuff. And, um, you know, maybe it takes a belter to think about shit like this, like long term yeah. plays using un, unsecured junk in space. But it fucks. And and it's another great battle scene because you see these these ships, but they're very tough. These are like dreadnoughts. Like we we very rarely mm-hmm. seen like the full Donagers like duking it out. And like, even though they're badly damaged, they're still like handing the the Belter fleet its ass until they're stabbed in the back from the ring gate. And yeah, that pretty much does it. His fools. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is really cool. I love the coordination, the timing that this takes. It shows that you know Marco was not just a guy who can get a couple rocks moving. Right. He's got a grand strategy. He has a plan, uh, whether it's, you know, a a good one for humanity. Who knows whether it's good for the belters and himself. I don't know. Um, We'll see it play out. But yeah, I I love the coordination that this took. Yeah, because they're all burnt. They're all going in like dark and like everything is just all coordinated to where it all happens simultaneously. Yeah. you do wonder, did the ring sta- so I wonder how they got messages to ring station without being detected. Um, because you had these ships, like how do you send a tight beam message without these ships intercepting it? Like or was it just like the ring gate decided to go rogue themselves? Oh, I assume that this um, was all prearranged. Right, at, how do you at pre-arrange this particular it? time? Well, you get your orbital mechanics chart out, right? And you start charting a path I'm and talking you say, about like how did they coordinate with the ring station because they're behind the portal there's three big ships like if you if you wanted to send a message to them i, I guess i don't know there's probably a million I mean, different ways yeah like anderson dawes could have done it like you, you can you can sneak belters in and out of there oh, right because medina station is, in on this? is uh, well i don't know but yeah i'm just using his him and his example of a guy who could have got this done like belters communicating with belters when, when you're talking about medina station being run by belters i think the back yeah. channels and the, and the belter factions are pretty strong. Yeah. Um, real brief uh, ship naming um, trivia. Uh, the Sagar Martha is a Nepalese name for Mount Everest, the highest peak on Earth. That's the, the Mar- Martian Doniger class battleship. Hmm. And then the two UN Nathan Hale class. Nathan Hale is a Revolutionary War hero, uh, a spy who was executed by the British, named uh, for Tripoli, the capital of Libya. Uh, but it's most famous uh, in U.S. military circles for the Barbary Wars, which is like a really foundational piece of military history for the U.S. Navy 
and the Marines in particular. It's immortalized in the battle hymn of the Marines from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Hmm. So 600 years later, still looming large in the, the, the Navy and the Marines. And then the other ship's name was Montenegro, which is a small Eastern European country along the Mediterranean bordered by like, uh, um, Serbia and Albania and Croatia, and I have no idea. But sometimes it's cool that there's like, who knows? There must there might have been a conflict in 2022 mm-hmm. or 2222, uh, and 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 who knows? Because it's all in the future history. Um, but that that was I thought those were that was cool. And, and you know, the, you mentioned the proto molecule being in play. I feel like it's honest to kind of mention how it's still in play. Um, there were a lot of people on Reddit who noticed um, during the Zemea fight that one of those torpedoes they fired had a blue drive plume, which symbolizes an Epstein drive. If I'm if I'm understanding this correctly, I didn't know that. I didn't realize that yellow uh, versus blue meant anything other than blue is proto molecule, which that would be insane for that uh, to affect the drive plume. So yeah, maybe it had an Epstein drive on it. Was was prepared to travel faster and farther than any of those torpedoes. Going away from the sun out towards the outer planets. Um, and obviously it was intercepted. Uh, we found that the Cortazar, that crazy scientist, is. Oh, man. We're, we're, we're jumping a little bit ahead, but I mean, it's. I mean, there was. A, the, the, yeah. This is kind of a little nifty little battle, and like we're following it from Avasaralis when they're cheering when the Martians show up, but it's actually the Martian separatists, and mm-hmm. they kick their ass in a little bit harder. Um, I, I felt it did, it did a good job of like showing how you crack this, like. In uncrackable defense because it wasn't just a micro meteors. It wasn't just Marco's fleet. It wasn't yeah. just a Martian's fleet. It was like, it wasn't just the ring station rebelling. All of these things had to happen because these are big, powerful ships. Yeah. Um, you needed so a defection. I, I thought, you needed a ghost knife. You needed another fleet coming in. Yeah. 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 But that like, that like brief victory turned to when the, they realized, Oh, these are ships are all registered as destroyed in action against Marco. Oh fuck. Yeah. And yeah. you, you find out here, you know, what's in it for Savitar. We've, we've kept asking, like, what is in it? He wants to preserve the dream of Mars, right? And how is that going to happen? Well, it looks like they've discovered something through one of these gates on another planet, um, Laconia, that is, is more uh, protomolecule tech. Um, mm-hmm. And they've got, you know, Cortazar? Kodiar? It's Cortazar, right? Yeah, Cortazar. Okay. Uh, out there is doing his shit and then we get like glimpses of it through the cloud and you know they, they finally show it to us at the end it's some kind of orbital platform that i, I assume was thinking is, like, is it like yeah is it like a spaceship station is it a, like a giant warship like unprecedented in size like what the fuck is it all yeah um did you did, did, did the laconia system ring a bell it does but i don't know why well, it's it's an ancient it's an ancient uh, sit, uh, uh, country, and its capital was Sparta. Okay, so I felt like that was a nice little nod because, like, clearly this guy is almost setting up like a religious war cult, like his little yeah. like, uh, and I don't know, there's something psychosexual between him and this this other l- the lieutenant. Like, I this is this is not going anywhere good. Like, you get you get to this extreme and it's just, it's going to be crazy and self-defeating I imagine, but probably in a yeah. way that's entertaining and exciting and moves a lot of plot forward next season. I'm sure. Um, but yeah, they, they get a hold of Kotiar cause like they, they leave with this ominous note of Holden saying, well, maybe they know something about it. We don't. And the smash cut to Kotiar saying, look at all this cool shit I'm building and I'm moving on to phase three. And, oh my God, a star destroyer up here. What the fuck? And they're like, all it, interconnected just like Illus. I yeah. think that's interesting. So they know of yeah, more than like just all, one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big tease, but it's also like getting me ready for season six. Um, and yeah, but, I'm happy because like a lot of this stuff through book six is not in there. Um, the proto molecule is like this big hanging Chad of a, of a plot thread at the end of book six. And I don't, I am looking forward to all of this stuff. Yeah. This album or Salvatar sounds like they've carved out a space that like essentially the belters going to get a, a, you know, system and mm-hmm. then the Mars is going to get their own cause they've set up, um, minefields and whatnot on the, the side of the ring. Uh, it doesn't feel like Marco gets any of the proto molecule. Like Mars is going to have this Mars faction is going to have it all. Yeah. That's interesting. 
Like that's a weird, that's a wild imbalance of power. Well, I think the trade off um, here is that the belt gets everything that isn't Laconia. Um, so they get the ring gate. They get access to all get these all planets. Thousand, like 999 systems. I think that's what I took away from this, but damn, I couldn't, I couldn't justify that with like quotes or anything. I thought so too. I thought so too, but like, I wasn't sure why Mars would give that sweet of a deal. Like pro molecule, know, baby. I guess they think that they can, they can like all they need is a hundred years in Laconia and they can come out like, Ooh, raw Spartan and whip everybody else's ass. Maybe so. Um, but so like as, as, uh, this, uh, Admiral Salvatore is explaining the importance of purity and their precious bodily fluids and, uh, how he, he can't be trucking with mom's keepsakes. They transit the ring. Everything pauses. And these fire demons that we've, these interdimensional fire demons is what I'm calling them. Hmm. Uh, that we've seen, like when that Belter scientist Ioye is that what her name uh, walked into the anti proto molecule uh, thing last season. What what Holden says he sees every time he's transited the gates that these things are getting angrier. I don't know it. That it could have destroyed the ship. Mm-hmm. I think that you're seeing these these are unseen. These are other dimensional things that are not directly interacting with the matter. And it looks like the ship successfully transmits it. And there's just like these red ripples. But like, this is not good. This is this is the thing that, you know, uh, the, the Martians and the Earthers and the Belters are all carving up the systems. And they're completely unaware of this terrifying fire demon, extra dimensional bullshit. And I don't know what to make of it. I yeah, will see. I mean, I, I'm scared of it. It's the thing that has given the proto molecule uh, so much trouble, and we can't even handle yeah. that. So it took out the ring gate builders. Um, but mm-hmm. it's like it's funny because my reaction is I remember that when I loved the expanse so much, and this proto molecule started, and it's like, oh, they're gonna have these bug eyed aliens from space. I don't give a shit about this, and I was totally wrong about that. That was fucking yeah. dope and amazing. Now I'm like, oh, fuck these fire demons. I just want to see the interstellar war. But I'm like, ah, well, you know, I'm sure it's going to go places too. So last time I talked shit about the protomolecule, it became a jellyfish and opened up a ring gate to the universe. <laughs> yeah. So Shh, I'll just, don't say anything I'll else, keep, man. <laughs> yeah. I'll just keep that in my, my, my criticism of that in my, my uh, back pocket. So uh, then uh, for the uh, post credit, it's not really post credit scenes, but instead of the ring gate, we now see, this mysterious giant ass suborbital thing that's growing over the Laconia system. Yeah. Oh my, what's it going to be? And that's all we got. Okay. Uh, we have some feedback and this is not our final episode of the season. We are going to do a wrap up podcast. So there's one more chance to get your feedback in before we go on hiatus until season six. Uh, if you want to get a message to us, you can do so at expanse at baldmove.com. Just email us there um, and we'll pick it up for next week's uh, wrap up, which, you know, those wrap ups are largely driven by the feedback we get. So I'm hoping people jump in and contribute. Uh, yeah. Let's start off with Caitlin wants to talk about uh, wants to sympathize with Naomi here. Just my two cents from watching Naomi's reaction uh, when waking up. I've never been scuba diving or anything, but I did fly once with a sinus infection I didn't know I had. Oh. And once we started our descent, I literally screamed out loud. The kind of thing you would hear dramatized for a horror movie. Not entirely dissimilar to Naomi's scream. It was the worst pain I've ever experienced in my entire life. I immediately began clutching my eyeball out of actual fear that it had just popped out from my head and I had to keep it in place. It was so traumatizing. I'm still scared to fly without taking a bunch of sinus medication, no matter how I might feel. That's that's intense. Yeah, man. Who's whose call was it to make all these bone chambers that are right next to our eyeballs and our teeth? uh, Be able to clog up and and get squeezed by atmospheric pressure changes. It's uh, I've never had that experience, but holy fuck, I've definitely definitely had bad bad sinus infections and without the pressure differential it's pretty bad oh man yeah and just imagine what it feels like if that's just your entire body not just your yeah every every joint every every joint in your body doing that simultaneously uh let's every filling every broke every injury you've ever had it's it's yeah it's supposed to be pretty fillings do they just pop out I don't think they pop out. It's just that like the gaps in between the, like the little mic, like the air, you know, the, all, all the places the oxygen and nitrogen can dissolve, start bubbling. And yeah. Yikes. Uh, Jess in San Francisco. 
I was listening to your podcast this morning and just wanted to add my two script. I haven't read the book, so I don't know what's coming up, and this may be totally insignificant. But when Salvatore was lecturing at the university, they spent a good chunk of time on the end of his lecture about holding the ring gates and controlling them with only a few ships. Do you think he was setting up our understanding of how Marco will control the ring with a small force? Yes. Now that I've seen this episode, all has been revealed. And um, it kind of, yeah, it shows the asymmetric nature of it. That like you can hold a whole, like you can hold a whole solar system. I guess it wouldn't be a solar system. You can hold this whole star system with just a few mines and a couple ships. Mm-hmm. And also, paradoxically, the ring station, the Medina station, was in a great place to um, defend itself. Like, you know, it took the momentary distraction of these big dreadnoughts and f- fucked them in the butt <laughs> with a few well timed rotten coconuts. <laughs> this is basically Deep Space Nine at this point. Like you've got a station yeah. sitting in front of one a single entry point uh, with a minefield in front of it. It's Deep Space Nine. I demand Chief O'Brien show up and and fix. You even what's had the space wrong. station renamed. It went from Tarak Nar to it's Deep true. Space Nine. You go from uh, what was it, the Navu to the, uh, the Behemoth, the Behemoth to, to Medina. Medina Station. Yeah, it's tracking tracking right on drummers, Kieran Arise, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just finishes up here. I, I hope that Amos hooks up with Peaches. And although I don't, or although I agree with your comments about Eric not really having a part to play moving forward, I like him and hope he will stay on. Scratching my head why he hasn't grown a new arm. He's an inner. He's got money. Uh, I don't know either. I don't know either. He might not be. He might like it. He might like the grizzled, scarred kind of. You know, it, more intimidating that way. The the most interesting thing to talk about here is Amos and Peaches. Will will Amos ever find love in this show? Is that what Amos's uh, arc is all about? I think Amos has a healthy separation between sex and love. He certainly does. Growing up in bot brothels, being a frequent participant and patron of one, I think he's he he knows that love and sex are sometimes linked, but don't have to be. And if yeah. uh, you know he if Peaches wants to activate her tongue thing and throw him around the quarters, I I, I think throw throw him through a structural wall or two. I think he would be down for that. Uh, but, I don't, I don't uh, know. He that, he's eaten too mu- too many peaches at this point for me to believe that he wouldn't be shitting well, where he eats. Like. Uh, you know, his uh, comment about that in season four makes me think that that would be a very bad idea. Yeah, unless also, unless you can link it up, unless the love comes first, right? He but also Amos is con- a man of contradictions because he says this like, I don't shit where I eat. But also he told Holden like, uh, wait, Naomi would fuck me like, <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> sure, there's an implication yeah. there that he'd be down for it. Yeah. Right, 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 right. So I, you know, he, I don't think he, that's a hardened. It's more of a, the, the the those pirate uh, hmm. rules. They're they're more of like you know guidelines than than actual, you know, real real legal consequences. All right. Um, and there's also some more stuff here about uh, potentially Eric's role. So John G says, I was thinking about Jim's question about what happens with the crime lord from a region of Philadelphia, where his power is based on that region and what he's established there. Arriving on Luna, which must already have its own underworld and some kind of existence, uh, existing balance of power. What can these newbies really do to get a foothold? It made me think of the early mafia in the U.S. and how it was roughly balanced between mm. Irish, Italian, and Jewish factions for much of the 19th and early 20th century. That did fight each other for turf, but it was usually not a protracted war. Then, in the 1920s, Prohibition happened. Uh, you have a very thirsty country and mm. now an illegal substance that people really want that created a vastly profitable but limited new illicit market and a strong incentive to dominate it, resulting in big mafia turf wars and lots of death. In The Expanse, Luna is not just going to have this influx of new criminals, but a huge general influx of refugees, and those refugees are going to need things that will stress uh, the existing system well beyond its capacity, opening up new avenues for organized crime that didn't exist in the previous balance, especially if many of the arrivals are rich people with private orbital shuttles uh, and a desire to reallocate lots of uh, and lots of cash or sorry, relocate. And they have lots of cash. 
People are going to be uh, herded into overcrowded shelters, and there will be many new opportunities to service the needs of those who can pay. In a sense, prohibition has just come to the moon. How do you feel about this? I mean, I think more Eric would be cool. I actually think, uh, and before, like the end, the very, very end of this, where it seems like the gate is going to slam shut for everybody, but except Belter interests, I thought maybe. Yeah, it'd be cool to like, you know, this is going to be like a multi-system war. Like you need like multiple fronts and people to represent those like Eric being kind of like the, the gray market, black market runner. And one of these systems would be kind of cool. I don't know. And like, these are, this is all great analysis, but this, this, this last episode is a game changer. And I think that like Luna and it's the criminal stuff is like small potato steaks. Like it would be like a more pointless version of Bobby's plot at this point. What do you think? I mean, I just think it's hard to. The the, the choke point here is the ports, right? It's much like Medina station where if you can hold down the ring, uh, the entrance to the solar system and the entrance to the ring gates, you hold down everything. Uh, Marco knows that. And I feel like, the power structures like think about Anderson Dawes at Sirius Station, right? He owned the docks. He owns the ports. Um, it's tough to get anything into series like it would be on Luna uh, to get past him. And those existing power structures have that stranglehold. I just. I don't know. I still see a big uphill climb for Eric if he's going to get any foothold here because he just he's out of his element at this point. But on the other hand, he is good at, you know, the churn. And yeah. this is like a big churn now. Now you got all like a, an entrenched warfare. Um, there's no the balance of powers have been completely flipped over. But like I said, is is that a necessary part of the story they need to tell? I don't know, because I, I, I a good question. I'm, I would watch I think, it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Eric would be cool, but they only have one season left. That's I the know. thing that I also think like, man, it seems like they could easily make a meal out of this battle but like i've i I, i've doubted the expanse before his ability to tell a tale in a a, a finite amount of time and boy like this episode felt like they covered light years of territory yeah um i didn't expect it like five of the six endings we got i did not expect (laughs) right it does feel like if he's going to get into this power structure he needs to start kind of at the bottom in the middle somewhere he's not Mm going to be able to straight away carve out his own thing he's gonna have to you know especially get the lay of the land understand the dynamics at work here there will be some time just figuring it all out and probably working his way up through the ranks like he did before in baltimore we'll see uh speaking of c c is our next emailer uh just just c and they say chloe from oh oh well chloe from san francisco never mind your name was right in the beginning uh, sharing some thoughts on why Naomi Nagata is such a great character. I always love to see female leads in shows. Naomi is a brilliant engineer. Her conversations are uh, inevitably past the Bechtel test. And although her boyfriend Holden is arguably the lead of this ensemble cast, she is a three dimensional character in her own right. But this week's episode of Hard Vacuum made me appreciate her in new ways. I first heard about the concept of strong female lead from Britt Marling, co writer, producer, and lead of the OA. Uh, as Marling wrote in the New York mm-hmm. Times opinion opinion piece, a strong female lead is an assassin, a spy, a soldier, a superhero, a CEO. She can make a wound compress out of a maxi pad w- while on the lamb. She's got MacGyver's resourcefulness, but looks better in a tank top. The problem is that she's only allowed a narrow specificity of strengths, physical prowess, linear ambition, focused rationality, uh, traditionally masculine modalities mm-hmm. of power. Uh, yep. Best ex- best example I can think of is Starbuck from Battlestar Galactica, for sure. Um, it's difficult to. River Tam. Uh, yep, yep. Uh, it's difficult for us to imagine femininity itself, empathy, vulnerability, listening as strong. Uh, Marlene explains this is where Naomi Nagata comes in. Marco and by proxy Philip talk about being strong, but as Naomi points out, killing people doesn't mean you're strong. In contrast, she has the strength to help and protect other people, no matter what race or creed. She unconditionally loves the son who was stolen from her and turned into a monster, and she risks her life to save him, but she leaves him for a second time when she sees there's no other choice. She fights beyond the limits of normal human capacity to disable the chain smoker booby trap. uh, Booby trap, sorry. uh, And she does it while wailing and crying with tears running down her face. 
Physically and emotionally wrecked, she hatches a plan that just might get them all out of there alive. I agree. Yeah. Excellent analysis. And I also really like that point they make about um, how these strong female characters have essentially just been the same action type of heroes uh, and anti heroes that, that, that it's, it's, yeah, it's just men. It's just men with mm-hmm. the tank, the better looking tank tops. Um, and Naomi does seem like uh, she is that, that different. And I, I think also, and our the, the, look, buckle up, people. The rest of our lifetime is going to be coming to grips with uh, the questioning of gender dichotomies. Yeah, like the writings on the wall, like this idea that like so, like strength is this and empathy is that. Like that's all going to go to fucking way of the of the dodo. That's going to look like bad race science from a hundred years ago, a hundred years hence, I feel like. So, Mm -hmm. uh, since, since, uh, the, the expanse is playing 400 years in the future, this stuff is all very super appropriate. Yeah. And honestly, it's the portrayal here of Naomi is better. I think in the show than in the books. Um, so I'm glad they went with this and changed it up. It's wild because in the first two or three books, I thought the reverse, like in most like they gave Naomi all of the dumb, selfish decisions that yeah. the group collectively made. And in the book, it was a lot more nuanced, but it's nice that maybe they've they're they're swinging the balance back the other way. Mm-hmm. All right. Rish uh, says, can we all agree that Holden's outfit is straight up terrible? It's like some weird pseudo Batman outfit. Uh, <laughs> at the very least, I'll say this sting wore it better in Dune. <laughs> It's Mar- hey, it's it's Martian hard vac armor, and we've seen it since the first season. This is what it looks like. I don't know. The, Why is know, he the, the only one wearing it? Because he's the only one that's got. I mean, everybody else has their belter shit and their Tyco shit that they're wearing. What well, actually wasn't Bull wearing this stuff too? I thought Bull was wearing the black Martian armor. Mm, I don't think so. I think Bull is wearing a saggy jumpsuit. Mm. Uh. Also, I can totally see your criticism of the setup of the Chetsmoka. Why breaking everything on a ship that is utilized as a bomb? Uh, why break everything on a ship that's utilized as a bomb and no one is supposed to be aboard? Good question. But I think we need to keep in mind the Belter habit uh, that nothing goes to waste. While the ship looks smashed up, I wonder if in reality it's more scavenged than smashed. This would fit more nicely into the lore of the universe and explain why there was a quote-unquote puzzle left behind for Naomi to solve. That if they had made the decision, like all the just all the control panels are gone, right? But the, I just keep coming back to they needed like because like if if they didn't say there's a tamper resistant mechanism, I just think that like Naomi just hot wires shit, yeah, and they have to throw that in. But that like they're they're just I I feel like that they're they're trying to square off a corner round off a corner that just can't quite be rounded. Um, and it's fine. It's not like I said, all in all, everything really works. I'm not going to think about the grates and the tamper seals and all that shit. When I think about season five of the expanse. Um, mm-hmm. So it's, it's fine. I just, I don't know if I, if I had uh, Dan and Ty I would love to talk to them about like how much of that stuff they were aware of in the writer's room, uh, how much of that stuff did they think that they were communicating because, you know, they wrote the books and they knew how it and, uh, yeah, I, but but you know they could also say, hey, it's uh, it's dramatic license. You know, we used to let we used to let shows get away with dramatic license. You know, <laughs> sound in space is dramatic license. Not anymore. Uh, damn it, we want realism. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm just gonna shout out a few people: Ryan, Am, Josh, and David, who all wrote in about uh, Lake Winnipesaukee and uh, the homes and the the you know the idea that there are islands in this lake and. This is like really grounded in reality um, as far as Claire having a house there with a launch pad. So uh, thank you. We, we got ton, tons of emails about that. And it's so like we mentioned it in the last episode, we kind of corrected ourselves. So I just wanted to, yeah, let them know. I oh, got yeah, your email. Uh, we, got, we got some Avasaralas and some Mal's writing in talking about their uh, space yachts. They got parked in Lake Winnipesaukee and yeah, I mean, not too far from it. But sure. How many winter servants do you maintain in those properties, sirs and madam? <laughs> I don't know about winter servants, but there's there's summer summer homes for sure. There you go. Uh, Got right. winter staff then. Jack the writes in. My wife is an elementary school teacher here in Los Angeles, West Hollywood, at the Center for Early Education, an elite private elementary school. 
It turns out Ravetta Bowers was a teacher and head of the school for 40 plus years and was brought back out of retirement this year to stabilize things for the A plus list clientele. And he lists without listing. He lists uh, a bunch of them. Most powerful power couple there is. He's a rapper. She's the world's most famous singer. Uh, Jay-Z and Beyonce. He doesn't say. He doesn't say. He also says a world famous SNL actor. Um, the creator of a show about an American workplace and a rage guitarist. All high profile Hmm. people. Uh, The connection to this show and the school is simple. The director of this and many past Expanse episodes, Breck Eisner, which is the son of Michael Eisner, is a current parent at the school. My wife taught this child a couple of years ago. I guess this was a little kiss ass move on his part or wink, but I think the former. Uh, Sorry for the mini rant. We were literally having a discussion about Rivetta before watching the show. Then I noticed it all over the ship. We were listening to your pod in bed and hearing you attempt to figure out the meaning and we burst out laughing. So I had to let you know. So this is kind of like uh, this is kind of like a a rich insider thing more than a this person did a long history of like slaving for uh, that's probably poor choice of your words uh, serving the California school systems. Uh huh. Okay. Sounds, interesting. Sounds like it. All right. Yeah. They, they just right. So know each other. Shit. Right. I see it. I get, I, I, I'm, I'm hearing what they're saying. Um, Alan C says, I know you guys have discussed a few times who will replace Alex, the pilot. It seems like bull would be uh, able to slide into that seat pretty easy. But I think there are a couple characters we have known longer than bull that would be a better fit. So hey, he's, too bad. He's, he's already slid in the seat. He's drinking a man's coffee. That doesn't mean he has to stay there. The first two characters that come to mind are Clarissa and Bobby. Both have shown themselves on the show to be decent pilots. Both seem like they might inevitably mm. end up calling the Rossi home next season, and we know both better than we know Bull. I think Bobby fits the pilot seat best since she is already familiar with Martian tech and military procedure. Uh, he also says, who knows, maybe Naomi's son ends up being a hotshot pilot full of teen angst and... Uh, he can come pilot the Rossi. I mean, those are all really good ideas. Um, I do think that like, it seems that the Bobby, Bobby and Clarissa have probably something to do in the books and bull like is going to, I think the bulls is straight. up going to be Alex. Um, I think so. Yeah, I'm with but, you. I'm uh, all in on bull at this point. Like I, I like Bobby and Claire and I think either of them would be good choices, but we've got bull. What if they recast Bull with someone half as cool and colorful next? Oh, the dude, they pull like a hard June a on bull us. Bull June? They can't they have a Bull they June. Slid, no, they just, slid, they just slide Blah June right into the Bull. Oh, no. <laughs> That'd be funny. They just recast him as the same guy. It's like he's, he's just, That's uh, just a he's middle just finger. A from Bezos. He's just a hot swap actor on the, the Expanse. Your main, no, no, your no. main acting unit uh, 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 flies apart. You just, you just put Blah June. Yeah. His and Bolt Nah June. They'll name him Alex. Uh, his, his first name's I, Alex. It's Alex Bull. No. Alex P. Bull. I hate yeah. it. I hate it so much. Nope. Yeah, it's probably what they're going to do then. All right. Chris in Australia uh, has some interesting stuff here that I actually didn't know about uh, their landing. When we were discussing the launch of uh, the luxury space dinghy from the lake house, he said it was poor design that the exhaust from the engine destroyed the launch facility in the house along the pink water security. We saw when the Rossi landed on Illus that the ships with an Epstein drive don't use the drive itself to affect the landing. The plume is too dangerous. What we've seen in the show at least once and a bunch of times in the books, uh, exhaust plumes either being used as an improvised weapon or a specific dialogue about moving to a safe dis- distance before kicking in the Epstein drive. Mm-hmm. Um, it says I believe that the ships are shown to take off and land using the tea kettle method where superheated steam is used to provide thrust the yeah, text is the, what was that yeah, those like RCS thruster type deals I guess uh, RCS typically steam reaction, I think those means a reaction control system but those might be not tea, like when he says tea because he's talking about literally boiling uh, uh, water because I think yeah a lot of the thrusters on modern ships are like peroxide hmm. uh, okay some kind of peroxide reaction but I, I could be wrong all right um yeah he says it's safe to use in proximity of things you don't want slagged and then when peaches starts up that launch sequence uh it's taking too long and that's probably what they're going to do is take off with that tea kettle method but Mm-hmm. Uh, instead they go with the full Epstein thanks to mm. Eric anyway um, let's move on to Scott 
I said you talked last week about the relationship between Earth and Belt's dependency for food, etc. The show has leaned heavy into this side of the relationship, but you've also laid the groundwork for Earth needing the Belt. The main reason for colonizing Illus was the enormous amount of lithium that needed to be mined. And it stands to reason that 24 plus billion people on Earth, there is a need for minerals that the planet cannot meet. What I love about the show is the parallels to the real world. USA and China are easily Earth and Mars, while the belt could be any number of African or South American countries that are exploited for their minerals, specifically lithium for the growing need in electric vehicles. Sure. Uh, yeah, I wonder how big of a part that's going to play. Like you can see with like the devastating effects, um, on earth, the resources might get tight at some point. Um, and they mention it, right? right? Like that's one of the things that the drummer's crew mentions when they confront Marco for the first time. Like, do you have a plan for this? He says he has a plan and he's, you know, shown himself to have plenty of plans before. It's true. Um, A big one at the end of this. So I don't know. We'll see. Joe D says, hey, guys, now that we're headed into the sixth and final season of The Expanse, I find myself, for some reason, thinking about the infamous criticism that George R. R. Martin had about the Lost finale. I know he probably shouldn't be named around here, but here's his quote. We watched it every week, trying to figure it out. And as it got deeper and deeper, I kept saying they have they better have something good in mind for the end. This ending oh, better George, pay no, off here. George, no. And then I felt so cheated when we got to the conclusion. I have all these readers who are waiting on the book, uh, talking about his books at this point. I want to give him something terrific and then pause in the dialogue here. What if I fuck it up in the end? What if I do a loss? Then they'll come after me with pitchforks and torches. Boy, this has not aged well, has it? I mean, this guy talked a lot of shit about J.R. Tolkien and, you know, his post returning to King, like, oh, what's Aragorn going to do with the tax rates? What's he going to do with the orgs? What's he going to do? And he's talking mad shit about the Lost Finale. I, mm, mm. I know. It, yeah, it really doesn't age well with what's happened with Game of Thrones. Um, but Joe Meanwhile, has- Dan and Ty about to spike the football on the last installment. Like, fuck yeah. Right. So this is Joe's uh, question here because the source material for season six of the expanse is already on the shelf and Ty seems to be super involved with the production of the show. Are you hopeful that the final season and finale will be epic enough to catapult the series up to the levels of breaking bad or the wire? Not sure if that's aiming too high, but I'm wondering if you think the expanse has the potential to be one of the best sci-fi shows of all time. If they're in fact able to stick the landing in the final season. Well, I will point out that The Wire wasn't The Wire throughout its broadcast history. It's not like The Wire had 50 million people watching and hanging on its every word. The Wire grows and grows and grows in people's minds because everyone sees it and says, oh, shit, this is like the best television show we ever said. It's very relevant because can't fucking fix any problem we have here in America. Any kind of long term systemic one, apparently. So it'll keep being relevant probably for at least 20 years in the future, at least until Mm -hmm. they they get get right about this war on drugs thing. I got to say, after this season, I am utterly confident that season six will be a fully satisfying journey and that there will be breadcrumbs for some, you know, for some future endeavor. And hell, they might work out some of the Amazon. But I just cannot believe the season six isn't going to be amazing. Like season five, like if this is the uneven season, had everybody worried, I'm not worried anymore. Yeah. Because this finale, like this, the, the, the way these guys can just like, accelerate and effortlessly crunch through so much exposition and material when they need to is I think amazing. Mm -hmm. I've not seen a show that does it like this. Um, So yeah, but like again, 20 years ago, the wire wasn't like everyone's consensus best show ever. It's, it was like a cult thing that like half a million people were watching on, on Showtime, you know? Um, Yeah. Sopranos are sucking up all the oxygen. So I don't know why the expanse won't continue to grow and grow and grow in people's imagination. Because if you see it, if you get put through those first four episodes, you're a fan for life. And I don't think they're going to disappoint people. And, you know, as star Trek and star Wars continue to kind of flail and flounder and, and do this and that, like here's this superior thing, this more adult, mature thing, more realistic thing. And I, I, I feel like it'll just keep growing. Yeah. I was reading some, uh, interviews with Dan and Ty, or maybe it was on maybe it was on their podcast. I, I listened to one of those. 
Um, but they were talking about how they did have an ending um, for the, the broad strokes of this show where they wanted to go. Um, so they're not kind of fumbling around in the dark here toward the end. And I feel like that that should give them some confidence um, to steer this to an end point as opposed to having to make one up on the fly. Um, Cause they have been steering that way for a long time. So they've got that momentum mm -hmm. and yeah, I mean the, the, the prolific nature of their writing, they put out a book a year. They're big books. They're, they're as big as anything Martin's ever written. And each one seems to be better than the last. So I, I don't know. I, I mean, it would be a shame if, if the ending was just not satisfying, but I have a lot of faith in these guys. Yeah, I would be it was it'd be far more shocking at this point than Game of Thrones, because Game of Thrones, you know, looking back like, oh, you know what? Those last two, three seasons were kind of in a trajectory that we were hoping was going somewhere else. Whereas, you know, these last I mean, I'll put even this six, uh, season, I think it's been a fucking banger. Mm -hmm. So it would be a real shock, a real shock if the last season just left you kind of like, oh, ugh, I, don't, I don't even want to rewatch this show. I don't want to read the books. I don't want like I, I just that's yeah. that'd be that'd be a hard one. I mean, it's possible, but I think I think at this point, you, if you're going in thinking that's going to happen, it's you know uh, uh, you're, you're looking for trouble. And I think as far as like it turning out to be one of the best sci-fi shows of all time, I think it's their race to lose at this point. You know, like mm -hmm. they're on that list so far for me. If they can stick any kind of decent landing, I, I think they they get there. Um, yeah. Uh, and that's it for the emails. That's all we got this week. Uh, yeah. Like I said, we will be back to discuss this in more depth next week. So stay tuned. So stock those emails in expanse at Uh Cause like I said, I, I'm, I, I think I want to have some thoughts because I've got a lot of stuff that I'm curious about. I'm, I haven't done a lot of Reddit deep dives this year because we've been doing all this stuff mostly in advance. And I, I'd also like, I'm just deathly afraid of, of spoiling myself. I had a near run around episode three. Yeah. And this fucking Ralph P. Macho crap, uh, this Macho Peru, this this whatever, this munch yeah. and plowing thing. I, I don't know what's Michio going on. Pa, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's that's that's the thing. I, I've been terrified. Like, I don't want any context of it. I don't like because it's it's I, I keep having flashbacks to the Red Wedding and how that like well, just even getting the term, seeing the term and just then seeing it in context, like it, it, it spoiled me before I was ready on the, the so I'm really oh, trying no, to stay I, pure. I would warn you off hyping that up too much in your head because a lot of it has already happened. Um, Ralph P. Macchio is here right in front of me? Ralph P. Macchio is standing in front of you, sidekicking his highest, and oh you're not even taking God. note. Uh, Jesus. Gosh. Yeah, right so... Well. A karate kid. It's right, right beside me. All right. Well, not be interesting. Yeah, I have yeah. no. Yeah. So I've so far, I have I have zero zero clue about what's what's going on in the last book. I'm gonna try to keep it that way. But yeah, I, I got some things I want to research and talk about, and hopefully you guys will too. Expanse at baldmove.com. We'll be back to wrap up this season. And uh, if this is the last that uh, we see of you, just know that we're gonna have lots of great movies coming up in 2021 of Bald Move. Uh, we're going to have, we're going to go revisit the walking dead pretty soon. It's going to be fun. Um, and there's all kinds of, like, I, as soon as they start producing new stuff, we're going to be all over that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, we, we'd love to have you along long term on the bald move, um, long range freighter to a new, new system to, to the Lacona system, uh, where a dishonorable discharge is a bullet or worse. Uh, Follow, but yeah, follow us on Twitter, Bald Move, and uh, check out our website if you want to keep up what's going uh, on. And uh, um, yeah, also this weekend, if you want to do like some concentrated forms of Bald Move celebration, we're doing a 24-hour marathon to benefit a Alzheimer's charity where we're watching Star all the Star Trek movies. Essentially, um, we're going to start that on noon on f this coming Friday. And we're going to finish it up on noon on, on Saturday when we're going to be wrecked. We're going to try to raise a lot of cash for uh, the, the research Alzheimer's. And then we're going to get 24 hours of sleep and come back this, this Sunday for Sci-Fi Sunday to watch this here episode and discuss it. And also don't forget about our, our uh, Stereo.com slash bald move after show uh, 11 p.m. on Sundays where we're going to be talking about this episode of The Expanse, the future of the show, where it's going uh, live audience interaction. It's really cool. Check that out too. So 
We'll see if nothing else back next week for the wrap up. And until then, I'm Aaron. And I'm Jim. Later, everybody.